Evening, everyone. I'm Lisa O'Halloran. I am your district trainer. I am so delighted that you are all here with us tonight because I this is an awesome topic that we are going to be covering. Um, so thank you for being with us in our Keeping Rotarians Connected series. Of course, Don Griffin, the man behind the curtain extraordinaire. And for those who maybe don't know yet, our district governor for 2023 and 24. So we're so excited to have him behind the curtain tonight. We know staying connected is really important to our rotary work, right? Um, it has tremendous value for all aspects of our lives, be it you know, personal and professional. So tonight we're bringing you a really fun interactive session on nonverbal behavior with some tips and tricks to help you improve your communication in the virtual world. So of note, we are recording the session. It will be available later um, for you on the district website. So we'll get started. Uh, our presenter tonight is Kristen Bach. A little bit about Kristen. As a shy, awkward teenager, we need to like think black clothes and permed 80s hair, Kristen became an avid people watcher. This led to her graduating with a psychology degree with a minor in art, because after all, it went along with her fascination with humans and her trendy black fashion. After 25 years in nonprofit, she's built her expertise in training and body language coaching. With these superpowers, she partners with leaders to improve their self-awareness -aware and their interaction with others. So welcome, Kristen. We're delighted to have you with us tonight. Yay, okay, am I unmuted? You are. Yes. Okay, it took me a little figuring out. So anyway, welcome everyone. And as Lisa said, the goal for the evening is really to talk about communication skills or your powerful people skills. So the plan is for me to share some body language basics and we'll have a breakout room and kind of talk about that. And then when we resume, I want to talk about how we can apply this to the virtual world. So this is gonna apply to every aspect of your life, I hope. This helps build professional skills. And as you know, we're all on Zoom and I think we're gonna be for quite some time. So let's, let's dive right in and get started. All right. Oh. Here we go. All right, in 30 minutes, two people can send over 800 nonverbal signals. So in 30 minutes, 800. If you really kind of let that land, it's like a game of tennis or ping pong where we're sending messages back and forth. So if you're not able to read or understand those messages, you're missing an entire channel of communication. So that's what I really wanna talk about is just some real basic things that I think we need to know. So I'm gonna have you take a look at this picture here. This is a little history lesson. This is 1960. And this was the first televised presidential debate. So this, I'm sure you know, but this is Richard Nixon, Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy. So while I'm just talking about this picture, I want you to just put in the chat what you're seeing here. What tells you Kennedy has this? So again, Here's 1960, they're going on air. And a couple of things to note, it, there, there's a lot of lore and stories about this, but this was incredibly powerful moment in our nation's history because in 1960, not everyone had a television. So literally half of the nation watched the debate and half listened to the debate on the radio. And the half that listened were sure that Nixon won and the half that watched were sure that Kennedy won. And as a matter of fact, a lot of people at the exit polls cited this, um, this debate here as really a deciding factor in their decision. And Nixon put in his memoir, he believes it, it was this debate that cost him the election. So a couple things I'm seeing here. Um, so Kennedy's cross legs, unbuttoned coat, he's relaxed. Nixon looks uptight. Um, John is more relaxed, yeah. Uh, oh, not seeing the photo. Hmm. Okay. That's a Don question. <laughs> um, all right. So a couple things. Um, oh, gray suit, bad for black and white. Yeah. So uh, Nixon was actually injured on the campaign trail. He had injured his knee. And I believe even going in the studio that evening, he bumped it on the car door and re-injured it. So you can see him holding his knee and it looks like he's about ready to leave. He's in the, the runner stance. Um, which we don't want in a leader. But one of the big things is when, during the debate, when they first introduced the candidates, 
When they introduced Nixon, he looked at the moderator and Kennedy. When they introduced Kennedy, Kennedy looked at the camera and did a, a, you know, a, a slow nod. Um, Non-verbally, this was huge because when we look at someone, we're indicating that's the leader. And what I mean by that is if I, if I ask a kid, would you like a cookie? Most kids will look to their parent for permission which is the nonverbal cue of, I need to check with the leader to make sure that's okay. So Nixon literally cued the nation, that's your leader. And then throughout the debate, he, he was looking at the moderator and Kennedy. Kennedy knew to look at the camera and talk to the people. So big difference. And it was so disturbing, like they were like, what happened that no presidential candidate agreed to do another televised debate for 16 years. So 16 years, it was 1976, Ford, or, Ford and Carter, I believe, were the next few that agreed to do that debate. So, all right, what percentage of our communication do you think is nonverbal? If you want, you can, you can put a number, put the letter in the chat. You think it's 10, 25, 50, or 60? D, 80%, <laughs> 60. <laughs> 60. Yes. Yes. Okay. I knew this was going to be a smart group, but yes, the answer is um, 60%. 60% or more, actually. It depends on context. So pick your study, but anywhere from 60 to 93% of our communication is nonverbal. So those are big numbers to be thinking about. If I'm, and I'm skewing low here, I'm saying 60. Most people, when they're giving a presentation or they're going on an interview or going on a date or having a meeting, whatever it might be, they're, they're really considering what they're going to say, which is important. However, from this moment forward, I want you to think about how you're saying it and all the nonverbals that go along with that. So what do I need, mean when I say nonverbal communication? Well, there's a couple components. I mean body language, so facial expressions, posture, stance, all of that comes into play. So if I show you these pictures here, my guess is that you probably would pick the woman in the red top as the person you'd want teaching you this evening. That the other two look tired, insecure, like you know immediately the woman in red, and that's without saying a word. So again, that's that's body language. I also mean tone of voice, and that's one that people often don't think about or give, give a lot of consideration to. But there's a lot with our voice. So volume, tone, uh, think of like sarcasm, pitch, and then the question inflection. And that's where you simply go up at the end of a sentence. Um, so it sounds like a question, which is really kind of begging a negotiation. But our vocal tone really does matter. And then ornaments. And what I mean by ornaments, sorry guys, this is skewing heavily women, but what you wear, how you do your hair, do you wear makeup, do you wear a tie, do you wear a suit, all these kind of ornaments or decorations really are a huge indicator of who we are, or at least our brain perceives that to be a, a really big indicator. So our nonverbal signals are 12 to 13 more times more powerful than our accompanying words. So even things like me saying, I'm going to cover five different topics tonight. Your mind's going to kind of explode, right? Because I did three and I should have done five. Our, our nonverbal signals really are given more weight. So that vocal tone where we hear the sarcasm, that's all part of it. And I believe this is really one of the most powerful tools we have. So when you are able to learn and read and, and understand how to leverage your communication, it makes you a much, much better communicator and more authentic and empathetic and real. So let's get started. I, I have four different ones that I want to cover with you and we're going to start with trust indicators. So what part of the body do you notice first? So when you first meet someone, and if you want to 
put them in the chat. Lisa, that was great if you want to read off a few. Absolutely. Eyes. Eyes again. Mm -hmm. Eyes. The eyes have it? The face. Yeah. The eyes. The eyes. Okay, you are all right. Um, for sure, the face. We are definitely taking in a lot of that. That is part of the equation. But interestingly enough, what our brain is actually scanning are our hands, because our hands are our trust indicators. And if you just think about it, um, hands can do harm, right? This is saying like friend or foe. This is literally why police officers say, put your hands up. <laughs> um, this is showing your intention. So if we go back to like caveman days, we needed to know very quickly, are they carrying a rock or a spear? And that still is lingering in our days now too, that we need to know, is this a friend or foe? So an interesting study found that jurors find defendants who put their hands under the table as more sneaky, untrustworthy, and deceitful. Pretty interesting, right? So my hunch is that the jurors aren't thinking, I can't see their hands, I'm not buying a word they're saying. It's just something in their brain that's saying, I don't know, I'm questioning this, I don't know if I believe them. Important information to know. So this hopefully should be telling you to use your hands. I want you to keep them visible and expressive. So in your, certainly your virtual life, but um, your day-to-day -day life, I want you to start considering using your hands. So if you are the person who can't speak if your hands are tied at your side, tonight's your night. <laughs> I'm giving you permission to really start using your hand gestures. Um, so keeping them out of your pockets, if that's your habit, you're going to start tonight working on breaking that habit um, and using them to be expressive. Now, there's a range. There's, there's a spectrum with it. So if you're using too many hand gestures, that can be a negative, or if you're not using any, that can be a problem. But there's really no right or wrong. It's your intent. So I want you to imagine like a, oh God, what is it, a strike zone? Was that in baseball? You've got your, your strike box. Um, when you keep your hands in the box, that's kind of your safe spot. That's, that's where we normally, when we're speaking, we speak with our hands here. If you go outside the box, and if the whole evening when I was talking to you, I was sharing my ideas and they're up here, um, you might think I'm a little bit crazy or over the top. This is more energetic. If the entire time that I spoke, I didn't use my hands at all and I kept them at my side, I can actually even hear how I just kind of lose energy. Uh, so it's really the intent. So if, if you're speaking with someone and you want to show that, you know, I've got a really big idea, great. Or if you want to bring the mood down, fine. Um, just be aware of how you're using your hands and really start thinking about the gestures. Um, gestures are important for, for two reasons. One, they help, they help your cognitive load. So when you're speaking, when you use your hands, that's why a lot of times it's really hard to speak without using your hands because it's lessening your cognitive load. Um, and the second reason really is because when you use your hands, it's, the person is seeing it on two levels. They're, they're, they're hearing you and they're, they're seeing it. So it's like underlining or bolding your words. So it, it helps them understand in addition to helping you explain. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, but there, there's little things. You can talk about, hmm, we're going to do this in steps. We're going to make just some tiny tweaks. Um, or my example, it's underlining and bolding. You're just giving them the visual cue when you do this. All right, so skill number two, purposeful gauging. My hunch is that as a kid, you were told, you know, look someone in the eye, keep your hands out of the pocket. Those are the body language basics. So those do have merit. So let's get into the purposeful gazing. So there's two, two types that I want to show you this evening. The first is professional gazing. So professional gazing is a very confident, competent way of, of speaking to someone. So this means that when you are talking, you're looking at the person's eyes. 
Um, and then when you break your gaze, your eyes go up to their forehead. So it's like a triangle. So hopefully I'm explaining this well, where you're talking, and it's, it, this doesn't mean like eye, eye, forehead, you're not doing this, but um, that you're looking at them, and then when you naturally look away, this way of looking, the person looks up high. Several studies have shown that a lot of leaders do this. When they track their eyes, they find that they tend to use this quite a bit, that breaking gaze goes up. The other version is social gazing, which is where you're looking at the person's eyes, and then when you break gaze, your, your eyes drop to the mouth. So it's like an upside-down triangle. And hopefully you know what I mean by breaking gaze. Just it, because if, if, if you're talking to someone and you never stop looking at them, it, that's not cool, right? So when you look away, these people are looking down. So be thinking about what your natural tendency is. Uh, mine is social gazing. It's a very, um, it's a more friendly, warm cue. So again, it's just understanding and knowing if you are in a situation and you want to show your competence or that you're on an equal level with someone, professional gazing. If you want to show you're friendly and you're going to work together, you might want to use social gazing. Uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. It's much more tricky on Zoom. All right, again, there is a spectrum with eye contact. So that happy, happy spot is 60 to 70% eye contact. That's what in our country feels about right. And you'll notice I say our country because there's different cultural takes on this. More than 70% here feels a little bit creepy, like someone's making too strong of eye contact or they're looking too long. And if you're making less than 60%, that's often seen as avoidant, which in our, our culture, you know, you look someone in the eye. Our family hosts exchange students, and I can say that we've hosted several that in their culture, that was a sign of respect, to look down um, when you're speaking to them. So there's, there's different variables and things to take into account here. Happily, most of us do 60 to 70% just naturally. But if, if you've ever been told, you know, look at me, or, wow, you have really good eye contact, that's code for too much. <laughs> um, so be thinking about um, where you think you follow that, and then which one you use. Are you using the more competent or warm cues? All right. First impression. This is our third skill. How long do you think you have to make a first impression? I'll just have you put that in the chat. Any guesses how long we have? 10 seconds, 1 minute, fraction of a second, 3 seconds, 5 seconds, 2 seconds. Okay. Great. Great. You're catching that it's, it's very quick. So yeah, the person that even said fraction of a, se fraction of a second, absolutely. So it can be instantaneous. Uh, again, pick your study, but up to like 7 seconds, 30 seconds is getting long. That's about how long we have to make our first impression. So it's pretty quick. So when I even put these images up here, um, your first impression happens the moment someone sees you. It's not the first time you speak. So uh, immediately as I'm talking here and here, you, you've already probably pigeonholed these individuals. You've thought shy, tough. Um, fun but a little quirky, mysterious, whatever. You're, you're putting people in their box. And what that is, is our brain has gotten really good at identifying and putting people in a category as a way of preservation. Right? Again, we need to know friend or foe. That's what is going on here. And the thing is, is we're pretty good at it. Also, we're really stubborn. So if I put someone in a bucket or in a, in a category, I find, re find reasons to reinforce that, to, to show that I was right. So it becomes incredibly hard once you've made a decision to kind of move a person out of that, that realm you've put them in. So I want you to think about um, the acronym PAIN when you think about first impressions. So P, permanent, again, we've put them in that category. It's not impossible, but it, it takes a little more finagling, right, to get someone out of that 
of first impression, um, were pretty accurate, 76% to be specific, that we, we're not 100%, but 76 isn't bad. Um, it's immediate, again, you know, just a split second to a few seconds, and it's all based on nonverbals. It's not the moment someone speaks. So you already, if, you, if I was in here and you saw me before I even started speaking, you already had an idea of, of how you thought this might be, how this will go, etc. That's terrifying, right? Okay, so Frank Bernary is a researcher, and he had this pretty cool study, or a really clever study, where he wanted to get at first impressions. So what he did is he designed an experiment, experiment where he had trained evaluators do interviews, and he had two different groups. So in the first group, he had the trained evaluators grew, uh, interview a group of participants and rate the candidates on their warmth, competence, and confidence. So they did 20-minute interviews, and he filmed the, filmed the interview. All right, people did their scores. He then took that footage, the video footage, and he gave it to a second group of trained evaluators, and he asked them to rate the candidates, again, on warmth, competence, and confidence. However, in the second group, he only showed them the first 20 seconds because his goal was um, really to limit any kind of verbal talk. You know, so per obviously the person's probably coming in, saying hello, nice to meet you, shaking their hand and sitting down. But other than that, there was not, um, they weren't talking about interview questions or their qualifications. And you guessed it, within 20 seconds, that second batch of evaluators were already giving the individuals the same mark. So that really is the power of a first impression, and that's all based on nonverbals. All right, and the last one I want to talk about is fronting. So fronting is actually one of my favorites. Uh, fronting is, and this was by Frank Karamoff from the University of Brussels, he found that when we view someone straight on, we view them as more trustworthy, open-minded, and sympathetic, which makes sense. The more you can take in of someone, the more you can assess and gauge. So the more you can see, the better, uh, which is why when I work with people, I tell them never to stand behind a podium. Um, you want people to be able to see as much as possible. Okay. So fronting is when you face your top torso and toes towards someone. Fully face them. It's also called naval intelligence. And if you think, just kind of imagine um, a string coming from your navel or your belly button and attaching to the other person's belly button. So it's like a straight line. If you try and keep that in alignment, that's fronting. What this does, it's the ultimate way to give nonverbal respect. You're giving your full attention. Uh, the thing is, is we think we're doing it, but we often aren't. So I was certified in body language by the Science of People. And the Science of People did their own study. They were at a conference. They explained the concept of fronting, and they asked participants at the, at the conference, how many of you front when you're networking, when you're speaking with people? 75% said, I front. Absolutely, I'm fronting. So they filmed the conference, and then when they w went back and looked at the footage, it was actually 30% that actually were fronting. Um, because often we are tilted a little bit, our feet are askew, uh, feet, as a fun fact, are often really big tells. Um, our, feet, our feet point in the direction of the person we want to speak to, or where we want to go, or what we're thinking about. So feet will often be pointed at the bathroom, or the food, or the person that someone wants to speak with. Uh, so just that slight cue, and this is also incredibly helpful. Um, remember when we had like networking in person, <laughs> like go back a year or nine months, um, if you see some people talking in a group, if, if they're kind of opened out, that means it's okay for you to join. If they're fully fronting and facing one another, they're engaged in a, in a you know, deep conversation, they're, that's, they're not cueing you to join in. So you can start picking up on things like that um, so you know kind of your parameters as well. Kristen Andy has a comment that pertains here. He says, I've heard to look at the other person's feet. Are they pointing?
poised for a getaway? It can be. Yeah, absolutely. And you do it, you know, unconsciously. So, or you can do it consciously. If you need to get going and you just shift your feet, it, you would just cue the person to kind of speed up. And we do that. And people know, like, oh, you got to get going. So you can use that tip. <laughs> Liz, Liz has a question about when you're in a circle or in another group setting, should we physically turn as we speak to each person? Okay, so perfect, Liz. So, yeah, while sitting in groups, the answer is um, you want to turn in your chair, or actually turn your chair um, to fully face them. That's, that's how we do it. The thing is, when you do this, you actually are a better listener. Like, your retention is better, um, and the person feels it. So I had a client who uh, was a professor, and she said that when she really focused on this, um, she had people asking her if she got her hair cut. So no way of proving it, but our thought is people could feel there was a difference, and so they were just like, hey, did you get a haircut? <laughs> they just knew something was different. So this is why it's one of my favorite tools. Um, it's just good with my family to like really put my phone down and like fully face my kids when speaking so they can feel heard. Um, also great with colleagues, friends, anyone. But yeah, when you're sitting in groups, it probably means you turning in a chair. Uh, watch Oprah. She's genius at it. You'll see her doing it all the time. So, great question. Okay, so, how are we doing on time? Ooh. Okay, so we are going to do our breakout room, um, like 10 minutes. And what I want you to do is to talk about these topics here. So I, I talked about four trust indicators, first impressions, eye contact, and fronting. So as a group, how can you translate these body language basics to the virtual world? Because that's what we're going to be talking about. And share examples with your group. We don't have time to talk about it with a large group, so go in, have a great discussion, and I will see you in 10 minutes. Okay, and before, before I put everybody into, into the breakout room, I, I put a link into the chat so that you can pull up a Google slide of these questions. So you don't have to try and write all this stuff down. You can just click on the link and it will appear. Uh, you'll also get a notice uh, when, when there's about a, uh, a minute left for the breakout room. So hopefully it won't be quite so jarring when you come back to, to, the, main, to the main room. So have fun in your breakouts. Okay, so I was just going to say welcome back. Uh, I hope your discussion was really good, and I, we're trying to keep this tight. So if we have one, maybe two questions, does anyone want to share? Or, or, or Lisa, do you want to comment? Um, Roger, would you like to ask your question that you posed to our group? Go ahead. You state it for me. Okay. Well, he, he was asking how we can apply these to the hybrid environment, if there are any specific techniques that both the partic participants could use and the presenter could use. So anything to keep that engagement going. Yeah. Uh, so I'll go through the virtual part, and then maybe we can talk about that. I actually did present. I'm from Oshkosh. I did present at the Rotary, and it was a hybrid when I did it. And I think we're still working out the kinks on, I mean, they were filming me. I, I kind of heard on the other end, it, it's a little bit clunky, but that's where we're at right now. You really have to have the equipment to pull a lot of that off. Um, but we're getting better and, and we'll go through the virtual tips and hopefully that'll help you out. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I'm gonna just keep us moving. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're gonna demo here. So we're gonna do a one function break. That means you have two minutes to either get more beverage or go to the bathroom, but you can't do both. <laughs> so, um, and this is something you can use in your meetings as well. So just two minutes to quickly do whatever you need to do and get back here so we can keep things moving. So I will see you in two minutes. Okay, I'm jumping in, welcome back. 
Okay, so hopefully your breakout rooms, you started to maybe kick around ideas on ways that you can start applying these body language principles in the virtual world. So a couple of helpful tips. I'm, I'm actually standing right now, but if you're at a chair, sometimes having chairs with armrests is a way to keep your hands up. It makes you a little bit more broad, which is good. It's you're taking up more space. It's more confident, uh, but that's a way for you to get your hands in in the video or the virtual screen, because as I said, I want you to be able to use your hands and have those visible. Um, because again, our brain gives more weight to those nonverbal gestures. So I think I gave the example before, if I say I have a really big idea, you're gonna, you're, you're not gonna believe me. So when the pandemic first started, I really started getting interested in the night, in the night, um, the late night television, because now their interviews were done virtually. And I thought, I want to learn what they're doing. Well, actors and actresses are trained communicators. So I wanted to just point out a few of them and how you can see them using their hands. So this is a picture here of an interview with Jimmy Kimmel and Chris Hemsworth. And the interview, if I remember correctly, it was maybe like eight minutes or so. I took these snapshots like within the first two minutes. And Chris really did a great job. Like he, I feel like his interview was almost like a masterclass in using your hands where you can just see him using all these types of gestures as he's speaking. So fantastic work. We also have the lovely Jennifer Aniston. She also was on Jimmy Kimmel. Took her about 30 seconds to a minute to kind of warm up, but then she really started using her hands. Again, very expressive. And I wanna point out her, the image here on the upper left. Um, this is the expression for like, it's personal, it matters when people touch their chest. Uh, and so I think the question was, how are you managing through this time? And she said, you know, for me, I'm, I'm doing okay. We just do that instinctually. And then the last one is Matthew McConaughey. If you didn't know, he is now a professor at the University of Texas at Austin. And he made a clip um, for the students at the university there very early on in the pandemic, just encouraging them to, to do well, be proud of how they're handling the situation, um, et cetera. So it was a short, maybe five minute clip, but you can just see all of his hand gestures as well. So take it from the pros, um, really start working on those gestures. A few other do's and don'ts. Eye contact. So hopefully you were talked a little bit about this in your breakout room, but um, a lot with eye contact. This is the, probably the hardest one, I think, with the virtual world because you can't look someone in the eye. So like tonight, I can't see anyone. I'm just seeing my screen, but otherwise it would be a sea of faces. Now I'm going to just demonstrate. So if I'm looking at the, the screen and I'm reading my content um, or looking at your faces there, I'm not making eye contact. It's only when I'm looking at the camera. So hopefully you can feel that difference. This feels more like I'm speaking to you. Uh, one way to help remind you to look at the camera when you're speaking is to put, you can put a sticky note, like just a little smiley face sticky note behind the camera um, or tape a picture. I actually have a picture of my mom. Um, and I just, I put that on the back of my computer. And so I'm like talking to my mom when I'm speaking. So putting that, uh, if you, especially in smaller groups, if you can move um, the thumbnails of, <clears throat> excuse me, of the individual underneath the camera, then you're, you're more in alignment when you're speaking. Hopefully that makes sense. Moving that picture right underneath the camera. And then another one, this is the one I think people really forget about is you want your camera eye height. So the, the, probably the biggest thing I see people do is they have their laptops and they have them on their lap, which is really, um, it's a, first of all, it's not a flattering angle, but it's almost an aggressive angle because you're looking down on someone um, or if people get too close, like we, we feel that through the camera as well. So you want to raise your laptop to a height that is eye level with the camera. So you can buy products, you can just put, a milk crate, you can do whatever you've got just to lift that up to the right height. 
Uh, so here, this is actually a picture in the, in the beginning of the pandemic. I had, uh, my background was just a changing screen at the time. I was in our living room, but you can see I have a picture of my daughter behind our computer. I've got a microphone, um, a sticky note. You can also watch for body language cues. So things to be on the lookout for, and these are just cues. You have to take everything in context, but if you see people nodding, or smiling, or even leaning in, those are, those are typically good cues. They're engaged, they're listening. Uh, leaning back or crossing arms doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. I would take that in context. Did you say something and you see a few people leaning back or crossing their arms? Did something change when you talk, brought up a topic? That might be something to, to keep in the back of your mind and be mindful of. So looking for those cues. Lighting, oh, this one is hard, but yeah. So lighting, if you are standing, if there's a window in front of you, you look like the woman in, that's really pale. Um, that's true, I'm, I'm a very pale person and I my office in the living room, there was a, a window and I shockingly could look even paler. So too much light depends on the time of day, obviously. If you have a window behind you, you tend to look like the, the lady below, like a blob, just like a black blob. If you don't have enough lighting, people can't see you. Um, weird lighting, you can kind of look like the girl from the ring. Anyway, just be aware of how you're being lit. That actually is a, a pretty big deal. And consider your background. So less is usually best for a professional video call. I want you to really start thinking about your intentional background. So a few of you mentioned on the break, um, like the Zoom background. I will add, there was, there was so that, that's really great for branding and being professional, but it does look a little pixelated. Um, a study just came out when people were asked, do you prefer Zoom, a plain wall, or like someone's office? And the office actually was rated best. And that, I believe, is because you can get clues about the person. And that is a huge advantage for you. Like, you can be really intentional and give off the cues that you want to give off. So that depends on uh, so many things. Like, are you, are, are you on a lot of calls? Where are you professionally, et cetera? But those backgrounds are important. Remember to check your camera angle and dress accordingly. <laughs> So this was Will Reeve, again, early on, who um, is a reporter, and he just finished his workout, and he put on his suit jacket, um, but he, he had his workout shorts on, and obviously that went viral because people saw him in his workout shorts. So make sure that you've got what you want in the, in the shot. And then remember the BBC, the gentleman that was being interviewed and his daughter came in? So let people know. You're on a call. So actually, on, on our last break, I went out. My kids are working on dinner, bless their hearts. And I just said, oh, I'm still, still on my call. So letting people know that, yep, I'm in a meeting. Um, please don't interrupt. Go to the bathroom, get supplies, have a glass of water, get what you need before you start your meeting. This seems obvious, but um, people often forget. And this, again, early on, there was a, a woman that went viral, Jennifer was on a meeting. Her, she's the one that circled. She actually went to the bathroom. She forgot she was on camera. And you can see the expressions of people. <laughs> so don't be Jen. And then also, I, I've seen this somewhat, but just when you go, especially on Zoom, when you click in, it usually gives you your shot before you join the meeting. Um, have Check your look before you go on. Otherwise, it just is kind of tacky when people are like fixing their hair and making sure they look okay. Let's be um, professional and do that before we go on camera. All right, a few more things to consider. Uh, closed distractions. This is one that I sometimes forget to do, but um, those pop-ups or different things on calls, try to remember to shut those off so you're not distracted when you're in a call. Um, because people can tell when you're not looking or if you're looking at a different computer. And remember I said fronting, you know, when you're looking away at something else, you're looking at your phone, it's obvious. 
and try to have a more engaged face. If you've heard of RBF, I'm going to say it's resting angry face. It actually is a real condition. Uh, what it is, and I actually have it, is when you're relaxed, it's when the corners of your mouth and, and, and sometimes your eyes um, turn down naturally. So I have found that when I'm really intensely listening to someone, oftentimes I have my relaxed face and it, it can look angry. There's not a ton you can do. I mean, women can do stuff with makeup, but the big thing is just showing you're engaged. So nodding, smiling, maybe trying to do a little bit of the Mona Lisa. That, that's hard to pull off, but um, just showing that you're engaged. Because sometimes when you see yourself and you're, you're really concentrating, it can come across as angry. Then... Uh, remember back to those hands when you come on a call and when you leave just you know the the hello goodbye imagine it's in person that we're saying I'm a friend not foe so smile and wave it's your first and last impression and then consider what you're wearing too some patterns like large prints or even really small like the stripe picture I chose because that looks almost like warbled or just like super distracting. It can, you know, and, and if they had a busy background, that would be even worse. So they'll be thinking about what clothing you're wearing and jewelry. Um, especially if you have a microphone, that really picks up. So uh, bracelets, necklaces can be amplified. And I, actually my sister, her boss has worn a necklace and just clips her microphone to it and my sister said no one wants to say anything but it's so distracting. All right, then the big thing is designating a conversation driver. The big thing is when we don't know who's leading, you you have you're not people aren't sure who should go. So kind of designate, I'm thinking this more for your, your formal meetings where you have things in place. So create a conversation starter, you know, simple things, what are you grateful for, what was the highlight of your week, what was your latest win, whatever it might be, what are you looking forward to this holiday season, have something in place, so even like tonight when you came in, we could have had a conversation starter that you could talk about that. And then with larger groups, consider having a timekeeper, so we've been kind of sticklers with time tonight, like 10 minutes, 2 minutes, uh, keeping things moving along. And it, it means having a timekeeper sometimes. Uh, I took a class, oh gosh, it was about two years ago now, and it was virtual, and then we would, um, you know, and then we eventually met in person, but we had breakout rooms just like this, and w there was a timekeeper. So if there was six of us and it was an hour, we would literally would, you know, so the person would say, everyone has 10 minutes, and they would ask questions and feedback. Seems kind of harsh, but it really it allowed a chance for everyone to speak, and um, really kept things on time. Kristen, uh, Andy has uh, has yeah, a thought. Yeah. Sure. Can you read it? I can't. Oh, he, 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 he said that. So, Andy, you want to unmute yourself? No, no. I, I said I could wait till the end as long as oh. there's just one question or two minutes for questions. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Vocal power. I mentioned it's actually pretty important. Studies have shown, especially on a virtual call, vocal is more important almost than the image. Like you have to be able to hear the other person. So if you're on a fair amount of calls, and I'm guessing you are, you're a Rotarian, you want to make sure that the sound is good. So thinking about perhaps getting a microphone. So I'm just going to demonstrate this. So I've, I've, I don't know if you, you can see here. Here's my microphone. I have a little, it's called a snowball. So I've been using that this evening. I'm going to unplug it. Okay, so hopefully um, you can hear the difference. So now this is just defaulting, I think, to my laptop. I'm going to plug it back in. Okay, could you hear that difference? Or Don, can you tell me? It, it, it was it was subtle it was subtle this time but it, there was it was there but I've got the, I've got the headphones on so I can pick it pick that up. Okay, typically uh, it just sounds maybe a little bit more tinny, not quite as crisp, 
but um, something to, to consider. And then again, those lights. Think about um, making sure that you're well lit. As someone who wears glasses full time, it's been really hard to find a way not to get a glare. If I'm turning my head, you're, you're seeing the glare. Ring lights are really great. Not super great for people with glasses. Um, but start looking at that. I know Lisa is really pleased with her purchase, Loom, L-U-M-E. They have lights you can just suction cup to the back of your computer. Um, my son has that, really likes that. So there's really great options available. And then um, there's an app called Crisp. Uh, admittedly, I've not really used it, but it can cancel out background noise. Uh, I've, I've considered it because our neighbors literally were putting up a garage a little bit ago, and so then we had the construction crew over, etc. It's a way to cancel out those background noises. There's a free app and then a paid app, but if, if that's a concern for you, you have a dog that barks a lot or kids that might be interrupting, you might want to consider that. So, next steps. How are we doing on time? Um, what I'd like to do is do a little bit of time for feedback. So we're going to do one more breakout room. I would ask for you to maybe designate someone to kind of make sure you're on task and they're leading the conversation. And we're going to think about aha moments, what you want to be remembering from this. And your, your Google slide is to be thinking about ways you can begin implementing your virtual uh, meetings. What, what can you immediately start applying after our conversation tonight? And how are you being perceived? So this is a great time to get genuine feedback. How's my background? How's my lighting? Any suggestions? Um, because that is your first impression. So I will let Don work his magic. The link is in the chat. Is that right? Yes, link is in the chat. I will also, if you didn't grab, if you don't grab it now, I'm also, I will also send a message to the breakout room so that you might be able to grab it off of there. So, um, like seven or eight minutes, or how are we going? We're, ten? We're, yeah, we're still going to go for the for the ten minutes again. Um, and the breakout group has been shuffled around a little bit uh, because we've had some people drop off. So want to make sure that there's not one that's only got a couple of people in there because that's not satisfying. So, Okay, see you in 10. Oh, see you. All right. So we are at time. We're over time. But I just, I, I would love feedback if we... Um, if we still can do that. I also want to just, if, if this is of interest and you enjoyed it and you want to learn more, you can find me. It's Kristen Bach at bodylanguageblueprints.com. So I've got a website and I post blogs um, on things like backgrounds and all that good stuff. I also have a Facebook page and I'm going to be starting a Facebook group, Body Language Blueprints, where I'm putting up photos, like first impression stuff, so it's just a way to kind of sharpen your skills. So if that's of interest, you are welcome and encouraged to join. And she's also on LinkedIn. And I'm on LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, I would love to connect with you on LinkedIn. All right. So Don has um, a Mentimeter. Uh, uh, we're, we're looking for feedback. So what, what ideas do you plan to try? What insights? What did you glean from this? I, I personally would love to know because that allows me to create better content. But then as Rotarians, we need to know too, what, what resonated, what are you going to try? So Don, you can tell them what yeah. to do. Yeah. Well, actually, so Lisa, you, you've got the, okay. you've got, you got the spiel and I'll, I'll start sharing. Perfect. Okay. So what you need to do, either grab a cell phone, grab a tablet or open another tab on your computer. But we're asking you to go to the website menti.com. So M-E-N-T-I dot com. Go to that website and it, you will be prompted to enter a code. The code is on the screen right now. It is 8322064. That's 8322064. So this is a cool tool we're showing you tonight. We are eager for this feedback, but it's also something you could use in a club meeting to get participation. So when you log in and enter the code, you just get to free response to this question. What was your aha moment tonight? So what's your biggest takeaway? What do you think you're going to try? 
share some feedback with us. And as you enter it, it'll start appearing anonymously mm -hmm. on the screen in front of us. Ooh, that'll be exciting. Okay. Lisa, and if what's the code again? Eight three two two zero six four. Down hands, otherwise they blur. It's it's also right up here. Top of the screen. Top of the screen. And while you're doing that, I'm happy to answer questions. I know that you, uh, Andy, I think you had a question or a comment um, as these kind of pop up. Yes, yes, I did. Um, what I said to my last breakout group is um, I've been a member of Toastmasters and Rotary for a number of years. And there are Toastmasters clubs all over the place. They don't know how to approach Rotarians, but they are probably a bit more skilled than your average Rotarian at these Zoom meetings because, you know, they learn eye contact and using their hands and pitch and, um, you know, inflection and all that sort of thing. And so um, I did talk to Lisa and I'd like to try to put the two groups together since I'm in both of them. And I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, in my years, I've also been in charge of getting speakers and it's tough to get 52 speakers a year. And so this is a natural thing. And anybody who's at this, um, you know, this session uh, probably can see the value of that. So I wanted to throw that out there and we'll see where it goes. But those Toastmasters are there they are eager to speak to people they don't know, and including Zoom. So that's all I had. No, yeah, I, I'm going to pick real quick, um, Andy. Yeah. On what you're saying, Toastmasters and Rotary International have a formal partnership now. Yes, I know. And what I'm saying, yes, I know that. And what I'm saying is, I've talked to my Toastmasters people, and they don't know anything about approaching Rotary. Mm -hmm. And I know rotary people, so da 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 da. So Andy and I are gonna hook up and get something figured out. Yes. Right? Yes. <laughs> so you see the answers coming in, and this is awesome, you guys. Um, everything from the facing and the body language, lighting is critical, tone of voice, eye contact, uh, so that your share info learned with members, awesome, fronting, seven seconds, first impression, center your screen. Be prepared for the meeting. Um, good stuff here. Kristen, anything you'd like to jump in and, and share? No, this yeah. is great. So is lighting and eye level camera bigger because that most people mentioned it? Yes. Yes. That's great. Frequency so, of, of being listed. Yeah. Well, okay. So just so you know, I think Don has a copy of, um, I sent links of like just the lighting and the, the microphone and the riser that I use. Um, there's a million out there, but just to get you started, if you want to look at, and, and Lisa, your loom. Um, yes, you probably I, popped, I popped the links into the chat. I'm holding my loom cube, you guys. This is all it is. The light is about the size of a deck of playing cards. It has this nifty little suction on the back and you just stick it on the back of the monitor and latch it in place and turn it on. So you can see now I'm without the light because I took it off. If you guys are looking at me, this will be the difference. It'll show you how much better the lighting gets. Nice. Once it's on, right? Oh, yeah. it's a big difference. Yeah. This is without, completely without. I don't have it on. Mm -hmm. So highly recommend something like that. Perfect. Well, any other questions? This isn't a question, but Kristen, I do love that you kind of set a mood. You've got a smiley face behind you so that we maybe don't totally cognitively recognize it, but it's inferred. Mm -hmm. And then you've got a living plant, and you've got the, um, the sign that says hello there to get our attention, and then your book, books that you like, um, and then you're, they're in captions, cap communication things. Uh, so I like the way you thought about what you're in, you're unconsciously conveying to us. Well, Angela, thank you. That makes my heart sing because I really, it really was essential. Um, I, yeah, I moved into our guest bedroom and it just in the last few months, I thought I've got to really up my game here. 
Absolutely. So thank you. I appreciate that. Well, I think we'll wrap things up. This has been a fantastic session. Tremendous thank you to Kristen. I'm, I'm doing some applause here. Thank you for, for sharing your time and talent with us. She has invited you to connect. You can find Kristen Bach, bodylanguageexperts.com, LinkedIn, Facebook, World Wide Web, right? She is there to make those connections. So thank you to all of you. Thank you to Don for being the man behind the curtain as always. And thank you to all of you for taking the time improve yourselves and what you do. Take care, everyone. Have a good night.